What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Alex Svetsky, Sovereign, CEO and founder of Amber App, making Bitcoin easy by stacking stats on autopilot. Author of several seminal and important essays on Bitcoin, liberty, and freedom. The rise of the individual, the fall of the state, libertarians are not utopians, Bitcoin and lockdowns, do not buy Bitcoin, discrimination and diversity, why liberty matters, in support of the elite, dumb people, and corona didn't cause it. How are you today, Alex? I'm doing really well, boys. How are we doing? That's great. I, I, you said you were moving. Uh, how annoying was that? I mean, it wasn't too bad, man. I was just, um, I was just moving into a new place because um, I just changed country. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be here for maybe a month or two um, before I look to move somewhere else. Oh, wow. Sounds like you're a man on the move. Man on the move, trying to keep as flexible as possible in amongst this, um, in amongst the the madness that is the backdrop of 2020. Yeah, what what are you seeing out there? I mean, things are moving rapidly. Mm, what am I seeing? What am I not seeing, man? Just you know, they always say, um, you know, pe- people think that uh, that tyranny is supposedly done by evil people, um, but what what you know, the reality of it is. Tyranny is done by the average person who is too stupid to think uh, more than one step deep and um, and is overcome by fear and hysteria. And, you know, they actually support the, the dissemination of uh, natural rights, uh, you know, by whatever authority they look to for, you know, their, um, their veneer of protection. So it's, uh, you yeah, know, when I look at how stupid people are, like believing in, you know, some sort of fabric mask is going to somehow protect them. Um, you know, they like, you know, n- necessary, you know, things are apparently like going and shopping at retail shops, but you know, the gyms are not necessary. So they're going to shut those down. Right. Um, man, I don't know, man, like the world's backwards and the problem is the sheep support it. Um, and I, like, I, I don't know what to think Sure. anymore. Well, you know, let's take a look at your article, the rise of the individual, the fall of the state. You know, it's a, I think it's a very important article. Um, I really dig it for myself. I see it as the rise of the individual applying to myself. Um, but I'm mm-hmm. not sure I see the fall of the state, you know, at the current moment. Uh, and where mm-hmm. do you see things on the long curve? Uh, if you, if you kind of zoom in on 2020, do you think the state is falling or do you think it's, it's, it's rising itself? No, 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 it's been falling for a long time. I mean, the thing is, when, when I did stunt driving when I was, uh, when I was younger, sort of in my mid-20s, and, um, and when a car starts to lose control, um, the natural reaction of a person is to try and grab the steering wheel and try and force it back into you know, their control. Um, but what they end up doing is they make it worse um, and they, you know, they add to the imbalance of the car and then, you know, they end up flipping the car over. So, you know, the, the best course of action um, when something's out of control is to is to let go, um, particularly, you know, with a car or with any other complex sort of moving system. Now, what, what you find is um, this same sort of natural response by a state that is becoming more fragile um, and more afraid and more, um, more uh, you know, cumbersome, fatter, um, you, you see the reaction by them is, you know, basically spitting propaganda out of, um, out of every media faucet that they can, um, you know, spreading, like literally censoring common sense and, uh, you know, spreading fear and, you know, uh, they printing money like maniacs. Like th- th- this is sort of the death throes of any, uh, large scale institution is that it tries to grab on tighter as it's losing control. And then the tighter it grabs, the more it actually loses control. It's kind of like the Streisand effect, you know, is you, you try and suppress a bit of information and in the process of suppressing it, you actually popularize it. So 
So the, the state is falling. Um, it doesn't, you know, at times it might not look like it's falling because the state is further encroaching. But in doing so, it is actually, uh, it's unraveling itself um, because it's going to start to fracture in multiple different ways because the more you try and, you know, homogenize a, a, um, any sort of complex system that has, you know, inputs and outputs that are so uh, variable, you know, i.e. human fucking beings who are all different, um, and you, you will start to create these sort of outbursts in different places that will start to bring down the fabric of the, um, of the entire centralized kind of model that they're trying to, um, to create. So, yeah, I, I'm still adamant that the, the state is falling. The thing is we just need to um, lengthen our time horizon. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next year. But it's going to happen over the coming decade, and you know we're we're seeing it in its uh, in all of its panic stricken glory. Yeah, you know you you always kind of come back to this very interesting quote: um, "Hard times create strong men. Strong men mm-hmm. strong men create good times. Good times create weak mm-hmm. men, and weak men create hard mm-hmm. times." Where do you think we mm-hmm. are in that in, in that parable right now? We're, we're in the weak men creating hard times, man. Um, yeah, we're, we're, that's, you know, we're sort of like the chapter three of that, you know, so we're, 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 you know, we're going to come into the hard times that build strong men. And that's sort of where we're in the, um, in, in between those two. So, you know, like it's been pretty fucking good for society, you know, for the last couple of decades. Right. Um, and particularly those that are close to the sort of the, the monetary spigot, um, they've done really well. Um, and in their stupidity um, of trying to focus on things like, you know, I mean, th- there's nothing more dangerous than a person with a good intent who believes that, you know, some sort of utopia is possible because the only way, like, you can uh, drive for an ut- utopia is to, to first have the assumption that things should be perfect, that we shouldn't, as human beings, have conflict, that we shouldn't have problems. Like, that, those things are fucking natural because we live in a real world of... Uh, that, you know, within a framework of uncertainty, of scarce, uh, finite time and of scarce and finite resources. Um, and there will always be uh, interpersonal conflict because we are human beings and trying to remove that from society via some uh, ridiculous utopian ideal like, oh, we should all be happy or there should always be peace. You actually bring about a dystopia. Utopias cannot exist. Um and, you know, what we've had is, you know, good times where so much wealth has been created that, you know, you have a group of idiots, you know, and whether it's a conspiracy that, you know, there's some Bilderbergs like, you know, Alex Jones might want to have you believe or whether it's just the classic, you know, the road to hell is, uh, is paved with good intentions. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Like the, the result is the same is that you have these utopians who believe that somehow they can make society perfect. And in doing so, want to kill the very nature of life, which is this um, this kind of, you know, messy, free, uh, liberal, uh, conflicting kind of process. But that's the beauty of life. That's the beauty of freedom. That's the beauty of liberty. And they want to basically remove that from society, remove that from humanity so we can have this clean, sterile, sanitized, so-called fucking utopia, which is, um, which in my mind is the ultimate dystopia. So that's why you know, this cycle happens is you've got idiots who are born, who had it good, who think that they can make it perfect. And perfection is the lowest ideal because it cannot exist. Right. You know, yeah, you, you continue on about this in, in, in your libertopians are not, uh, Libertarians Are Not Utopians article, where you talk about how the current incarnation of the nation state is a modern experiment. And the idea of public property managed by elected officials with no skin in the game is a modern concoction and will tear itself apart because it is unlike mm-hmm. anything else in the natural world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I this is kind of a, a a new idea to me, you know, or or kind of taking the horizon of nation states much further. I, I just kind of always accepted nation states, and I think most people do. And this idea of, of nation states managing public property is an interesting way of putting it. Uh, what do you make of of sort of what do you see in politics right now? And I'm not trying to get political, but you know, where on the left, maybe they, you know, like Bernie Sanders and, and AOC and, and sort of yeah, I mean, this movement. I mean, look, it's, it's, they're all, they're all the same, just a, a different level of derangement, man. That's really the, the only difference is that, 
Um, you know, we, we are human beings and all species on the planet actually are biologically wired to, um, to respect territory and to respect territorial bounds. In fact, that's how nature maintains equilibrium. You know, is there's, um, I was reading a brilliant book a little while back. I can't remember the name of it, but, um, I'll, I'll, if I remember later, I'll give, I'll give it to you for the show notes, but, um, it, it's an anthropologist who, who looks at how throughout society, sorry, throughout all of, um, natural and biological history, the way nature evolved was through creating territorial boundaries that, um, that, uh, species all uh, respect. So, so private property is not some cultural man-made ideal. It's actually a, um, it's a biological imperative. It's, it's within us. Now, with the, with, you know, when you, when you take society and you sort of build it from first principles from a standpoint of private property, you then start to respect the, the three you know, pillars of reality, which are um, scarce resources, scarce time, um, scarce energy and let's call it four pillars um, and uh, what the hell's the fourth one um, and just general uncertainty of the future you, you, we, we do not know the future so when you take those things it's only through the respect of private property that we're able to um, to uh, trade amongst each other in a way that is um, multiplicative it's, it's additive like we, we can produce more together whereas the alternative is to basically, um, which is what's happened particularly in the last couple hundred years with the rise of the nation state, is this idea that a, um, a caretaker who has no skin in the game, so it's, there's, there's no private property there, there's no, there's no, um, there's no uh, disincentive for doing the wrong thing, where they represent the will of everybody, irrespective of what the individuals may or may not want themselves. Um, and what you what you get then is basically a raping and pillaging of natural resources, a raping and pillaging of people's private property, of their time, of their energy, of their wealth, of all of these things, because there is no um, there is no repercussion for the representative that is running that. Now, when we go back in time, and this is why you know I sort of Seyfedean has argued this recently with um, Alex Gladstein, and I 100% on Seyfedean's side is that monarchies, for example was far superior to the idea of a, a democratic republic or a, or, a, um, or the modern kind of nation state that we had because the monarch themselves was effectively a, a private property owner and they, they had to have a lower time preference because it was their land that they were trying to pass on to their children. Now, if you, they were a shit monarch, their family didn't last long and was quickly overtaken because they didn't build up the the capital to maintain their um their strength whereas in the public sphere what we have today is that it doesn't you're only in for four years maybe eight years maybe 12 years and your incentive is to deplete the capital for current earnings and that is that is a high time preference um attitude and that's where the incentive is and so you have to be like a really 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 powerful you know great leader to try and think long term instead of short term but the problem is when you think long term and you take actions that are long term they don't um produce fruit in the short term so what happens from a political standpoint is that people get fucking pissed off and they want you out so so fundamentally you cannot have a um a public political system because everything turns into a tragedy of the commons. We burn through all our resources, we burn through all our wealth, we burn through all our capital, and we basically we, we hollow out um, the society that the principles of private private property helped us build the capital for in the first place. So 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 this is where we are today. We're two two hundred years in of um of this sort of this replacement of private property by public property and public law and um, and we're starting to see the whole thing tear itself apart you know we're, we're we're depleting resources left right and center because we've got no accurate allocation of any resources whether human resources or physical resources and you know the, it's it's just a blind fucking scramble to sell the future for today and that cannot last yeah it cannot last it's gonna fall apart it's very interesting you you know you also speak about in the rise of the individual that the most important tool of our time, aka money, the ultimate resource, uh, and make it uninflatable, un uncensorable, and unfuckwittable. Money has now become an unforgeable form of data that no one can control or manipulate. Money is the battlefield. 
Uh, it seems to me like the, the American project, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is really important in your thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the American project was actually the first attempt at, how can I say, moving away. So it's, re it's, re it's a really interesting one. So we, we had this sort of um, tyrannical, um, you know, monarchic kind of um, state. And then, you know, as, as the monarchy started to build... Um, you know, public institutions, uh, the, monarchy, the monarchy became uh, more and more corrupt because it built sort of bureaucracies around it, which, um, which then built their own monopolies around the, um, the monarch and then started to, you know, push, you know, peddle this idea of, you know, uh, democracy, which is, um, you know, which is a, I call it a majoritarian scam. So, mm -hmm. um, so what, what was interesting was you had these Americans who, 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 or sorry, English people who left for America to start a new thing, which was not about democracy. It was about private property and it was about capitalism. And, and that's where sort of America emerged. And in that first hundred years, America went from nothing, from a fucking barren land to the largest, wealthiest nation on the planet in a hundred years versus these, you know, uh, kingdoms that had been around for hundreds, like they'd been around for centuries and in some cases millennia, and it overtook them in that short period of time. Now, the momentum that that had um, and the, the spirit of capitalism in America sort of, you know, lived on. But, you know, after the, you know, Lincoln sort of came in and, you know, uh, brought America together, so, you know, quote unquote, united it and, and removed the ability for, for states to secede. Um, you know, things started to, you know, spiral out of control there. And then things really started to go downhill when, um, when you had Woodrow Wilson come in and, you know, uh, add to uh, add the American forces to the, the dismemberment of the, the um, European monarchies um, for, you know, this idea of a democratic republic at that point. And then from then on, it's, um, you know, you, you've had these two forces of, you know, strong technological advancement, which, you know, is a deflationary force, which is a value add force alongside uh, monetary inflation and the, um, the expansion of the public edifice. And they, they've sort of been, you know, the, the technological advancement has been so strong that it's kind of made room for the, the, the public parasite to build um, long enough, but now, you know, we, we've basically stalled from a technological advancement perspective. You know, we've we've done a shitload of stuff from, um, you know, in the in the bits space. We've done fuck all in the atoms space, um, and we're um, you know, the 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 state is basically, you know, the the, the public parasite is running out of um, resources to to capture, um, and it's you know, it's it's gripping. At, um, at straws and it's gripping tighter to, to whatever it's got left in it. And it's, um, it's not gonna be pretty. So, so yeah, so coming back to your original point about America being really important is America was libertarian and it was a private property capitalist um, institution or, or idea, uh, let's not call it an institution, it was an idea in the beginning. And that's what propelled America um, in the beginning. It's just unfortunate that I mean, like I said, that spirit is still there in many ways, but um, unfortunately, the the, the public um, behemoth that is, uh, you know, the, the democratic republic has sort of, you know, suffocated the, um, you know, what made America great in the first place. Yeah, it seems like, or at least part of my take on it is that, you know, the, the project has turned inward and it's no longer mm -hmm. feasting outward and it's feasting on its own and... It seems like most nation states are, are like that right now. Um, obviously, I'm assuming you had the ability to um, emigrate to America in the way that you're moving around now, even if it's short term. I don't know if that assumption is correct, but it seems like you've chosen not to come to America. Um, so, uh, no, I never had the ability to emigrate there. No, no, no. That, like, because I've always been like an Australian citizen. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I. I well, we, I mean, I mean, like, would you be able to come here for a month? And, and it seems like you've chosen to go somewhere else for a month or two. Um, I would I would love to, but at the moment I don't think I can because mm. it's um it's closed off to to basically just about so, everyone. So does America still call to you in that regard? Not that anywhere calls to you, but is it still something that's an appealing option to you in the current uh, environment of nation states? 
Look, in some ways it does, man, because I know that, like, like I said, that spirit still exists in America, like that, that libertarian spirit. And, and, you know, that, I mean, it originally, like, that form of thinking, like that idea of, you know, private property was really sort of um, in, emerged in Austria, um, you know, in the, in the 1800s. And, and sort of that kind of, that center of gravity shifted after the fall of, um, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War One, and it kind of shifted over to America. And the the people who sort of led that then were your Rothbards and your your um you know your Hans Hermann Hoppers and your um and your Hayek's and your Milton Friedmans and all of that. So 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 basically, the the spirit of sanity, the spirit of that stuff, kind of still exists in America. And and there is like a still a strong you know, libertarian sort of spirit over there. Um, and I mean, a lot of the work um, and a lot of the thinking that's been done has, you know, been primarily um, in English as well. And it's, it's kind of, it's still kind of the, um, you know, I, I have hope for that. Like, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I still think America needs to be the disunited states of America. Like, you know, we need, like, you know, America should be 50 states, not one fucking nation. And you know, the sooner the sooner that happens, the better. Um, but like, I don't know. I, I still definitely have a calling for America. Um, but it's. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of wish that I was born two hundred years ago in some ways because you know that would have been the America you want to be a part of. But hey, you know, we've got Bitcoin now, so it's like a. This is America two point oh. Um, the, the way I see it. It's interesting. I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to visit Australia. Uh, I don't know about mm. your feelings now about Australia, but I was there about mm, I don't know, 20 years ago. I loved mm -hmm. it, and I saw it as sort of like a sm not a smaller American project. Small is not the right word, but a less populated America. Um, yeah, like just in, behind in demographically ways. in numbers, but mm. in some ways mm. just more exciting. Like I would go to uh, a town like Byron Bay, and I was like, "Wow, this is San Diego 100 years ago," mm -hmm. um, and everything was wide open. So I'm curious: yeah. Do you miss Australia? And, and Sydney, I, I think you're from outside of Sydney, is just a magnificent city to me. Yeah, look, it's it's beautiful, but like Australia's kind of been like, you know, they've called it the lucky country for, for God knows how long. And I think it's just been because it's been so far away from conflict and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I, I call it the ignorant country because it's like they, they haven't really had too much hardship to 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 live through. And as a result, they... um they're kind of ignorant to how easy it is for tyranny to kind of come through. So like things like, you know, Australia was the, one of the first countries to pass the anti-encryption bill um, to mm. sort of, you know, to, to force companies to build, you know, back doors or to, to, to force them to give um, information on, you know, private citizens uh, to police without warrants and stuff like this. It's just a crazy shit, man. So like, you know, that you've seen all the crap that's happening with Melbourne with, you know, this sort of push for mandatory vaccination and, you know, there's some laws that passed in uh, Western Australia and South Australia where they can come and take your kids for like, I think, up to six weeks if they think that you've got corona or something. It's like wild stuff going on. Yeah. That, why, um, why do you think Australia is taking it a step further? Or, or I mean, is it a rolling out in sort of test, testing ground for what they're going to do in the UK, <sighs> Canada and America? Who knows? It could be maybe that's the most docile crowd out there, the ones who are least willing to push back. Um, you know, where the social safety net feels good, you know, feels large enough that, you know, or, or it's the one where, you know, the, the government's never been, you know, historically tyrannical where, you know, people just trust that, oh, the government will do the right thing for me, right? So it's like, there's a first time for everything and Australia hasn't really had a first time uh, tyranny. So, you know, it, it's it's very easy again. And, and again, I don't say that as like some, you know, evil Hitler guy sort of rises up. Like in the beginning, Hitler wasn't, you know, his goal wasn't just to fucking nuke a bunch of people sorry not nuke but you know put a bunch of people in concentration camps that that happened over time as you know the 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 intensity of you know what they wanted to do um increase so it's um you know t today it's like oh yeah for your safety you know you have to stay inside tomorrow it's for your safety you have to take a vaccine and you know the next day it's like you know if you don't want to take a vaccine for your safety you're going to be in prison for the safety of others so it's like it's a very, you know, very slippery slope. Um, and the way it's always positioned is, you know, for for safety and for the good of the community. And, and this is, again, why I hate the idea of collectivism, which is why, you know, I always say collectivism is a cancer, is that um, when you replace the um, the rights of the real individual 
with the imaginary rights of the imaginary collective, yeah, it's when tyranny comes in. And the thing is, Australia's sort of been, and Australians have been sold this lie that, you know, it's, it's uh, she'll be right, you know, we're, we're all in this together and all this bullshit, which is, um, which is how you slip into uh, a, a tyrannical sort of dictatorship without fucking noticing. And that's the thing that, um, you know, why perhaps Australia is, you know, one of the places where it might happen first is that it may not even be a conspiracy. It may not be, you know, a quote unquote testing ground for, you know, tyrannical maniacs to do stuff. It may just be that the idiots have had it so good there that they think they can bring about a utopia for the safety and for the good of the people. Like, yeah. and in the process, destroy what made the society function in the first place, which is the empowerment of the individual. Yeah. You know, you, you have another interesting article, Discrimination and Diversity. And I have to admit, while, while preparing for the show, I, I was reading through all your blog posts, and I, I saw the, uh, for the second time, the Shark Tank one. And I, I did go and oh, revisit yeah, Shark Tank. Oh, yeah, an old one. Yeah, yeah okay. man. Yeah. <laughs> I did go and revisit. And, you know, it's interesting. I learned a lot by, by touching off from that point. I mm-hmm. Maybe I knew this before, I just or didn't, or I didn't remember, but you, you dropped out of uni at like 19 mm-hmm. and took your scholarship money and just put it in the market and made bank, mm-hmm. then you lost it all and worked your way back. Mm-hmm. I'm curious with, with you know, this kind of combining that with growing up in Australia and, and how did growing up in Australia kind of uh, frame your outlook on diversity uh, and discrimination? Well, I mean, I, I kind of say that those two things, so, so when I wrote that article, the diversity and discri- discrimination, I, I just kind of talk about it, how you got these clowns who are running around who are, you know, SJW, you know, social justice warrior, woke idiots, who, um, who sit there and say, oh, discrimination is bad, but the diversity is good. And I'm like, well, you, you can't have diversity without discriminating, you idiot. So it's like they, they, they come together um, and, you know, like they, what they do is they run around without defining anything and without thinking um, deeply about what it actually means that they're saying. So when I what I try to push in that article is this idea that, hey, discrimination is actually fundamental to human beings' ability to like the word comes from the word discern to, so to be able to 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 judge what is right and wrong for you on an individual basis now you should be free to apply your judgment your your ability to discern what you want what you don't want what you think is good what you don't think is good to anything you want it doesn't matter as long as um if you uh in, in, you know if you apply your discrimination to to an individual as long as you're not aggressing against them in the process um in which case if you aggress against them they have the right to protect themselves and you know aggress back to to uh, neutralize that aggression now um what the 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 point that i was uh, trying to get to with it is that if we remove the ability for anybody to discriminate you know on whatever stupid law they tried to say it's like oh you know you're not allowed to discriminate because someone's black then you're not allowed to discriminate because of their gender then this then that then that that's a that's a snowball effect which comes to the point where you know you can't discriminate about anything so then what happens is people become this homogenous fucking blob where we're all the same where we all think alike where it's just one big fat echo chamber where there is no more diversity so guess what by eliminating discrimination you've eliminated diversity and when you eliminate diversity, you actually, again, move, you, you deviate from uh, how nature functions. Nature functions because it discriminates, because it's diverse. And you have this whole um, complex, uh, chaotic system of life, which is what life is by definition. Life is not supposed to be clean and sterile. You know, <laughs> sterilization is the opposite of life. Um, you know, li- life is this messy, organic natural process of um of discovery which requires you know uh, as much diversity as possible to make sure it's robust and anti-fragile so when you remove that diversity when you remove that ability to discern to discriminate you um you you create this you, you basically create uh you know ussr which you know fell apart or you create this kind of um you know, homogenous bubble of uh, soulless individuals that um that are no longer different. There's no there's no longer any flavor in in humanity anymore. It's like drones. Um, so that's kind of what I was trying to push for that. So I, I don't know how to tie that back to to Australia, um, except that I mean Australia is very multicultural in that sense. Like you know, yeah. it's primarily 
primarily built by immigrants, I guess, um, to a large degree. Well, you know, as a visitor, it, it, it was a very interesting place to me. I mean, it's beautiful. It was, it was wonderful. But I, I definitely, I felt like, especially in Sydney, I, I, I felt tension um, between different groups. Um, I felt like maybe aboriginals were suppressed. Um, and not that they should be one thing or the other. Um, and I was just trying to compare it to my experiences back home. And then I was on my way to New Zealand. Uh, and I wonder, you know, because you come from a diverse background, and, mm -hmm. and Australia is a mixing, a melting pot. And I, I just wonder, you know, how much that, that impacted your your views on, on, I don't know if you experienced discrimination or or not. And I was just curious. And, you know, it was interesting going back to that Shark Tank video. Uh, you just see, I mean, incredibly uh, successful, confident person who, um, from what it seemed like to me, though, it seemed like you were, after that, maybe spending a lot of your 20s trying lots of different things and and really enjoying the ride. Um, and that, like, somewhere along the along the line, you when you get to Bitcoin, like, everything gets super focused on mm -hmm. on, on this, this tool. And, and now we're talking about freedom and liberty all the time. Yeah, so, okay, let's touch on a few things then. So, so yes, in Australia, um, it's a melting pot. You know, there's all sorts of different cultures and stuff like that. Um, there, there's always tension between the cultures because, you know, they're different and that, that's a good thing. T tension, tension, and again, the tension and discrimination is a good thing. You don't want everyone to be the same. So, you know, the like in Australia, you've got the, the lebs, you know, don't like the Vietnamese, don't like fucking the white people, don't like this, don't like that. But but there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, they, they, they sort of like when you have um, a constant uh, tension, um, it kind of keeps violence at bay. But when you try and force integration, um, you you end up creating like this this subliminal fucking resentment, and that's when you you start to like you either create the subliminal resentment which blows up in a bigger way later, or what I believe even worse is that these different people and these different groups give up what made them unique in the first place. They give up their culture, they give up their you know their 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 values, they give up their um you know their, their their, their patterns which are unique to them um, and they all start to look the same sound the same behave the same and you you know you again you kill the life out of society so so yeah when i was younger you know i would call the wog which is kind of like you know similar to fresh off the boat like you know all that sort of stuff and even though i wasn't i was born in australia but like we kind of like you know instead of me complaining about it and being a fucking victim and participating in the oppression olympics where oh look at me i've been you know discriminated against i took that and I, you know, I let it energize me. I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I'm a wog, um, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to make it a cool thing. And, and that's what a lot of, you know, kids, particularly in my sort of generation, like sort of, uh, you know, from a couple years younger than me, so sort of, you know, born in the, um, probably born in the, the early eighties through to, you know, the nineties, the maybe the early nineties. So there was a decade of us there who didn't, you know, we didn't take that shit, you know, rolling over. We didn't sit there and scream and bitch and whine about being called, you know, a name. We kind of took it on and we embraced it and we, you know, we made it cool. And, you know, we, we developed our own little culture out of it. And that, that was, that was cool. And, um, and again, that's how you build strength. You, you don't focus on being a victim. You know, you focus on, uh, you know, using things to fuel you. And, and for me, that's always been, um, you know, a, a big thing for me like I've, I've never wanted to be a victim and and i think that's also one of the big drivers for me having always you know pursued entrepreneurial um you know pursuits like, right. um you know that um so like you know i've always i've always tried to create things as opposed to waiting for somebody else to give it to me so i've always you know believed in this you know idea of personal responsibility you know as the only way forward um you know I've, I've lost many times i've gained a few times and sort of like it's all evened out over the years you know there's things that i wish i didn't do but you know they, they sort of helped me learn and helped set the frame for me to be ready to be the person that i am today and like shark tank was an interesting um experience to me because you know that was my mentor at the time was like look you're going on a show which has no value for the business it's just um it's just entertainment value and, and i was young and stupid and i thought hey that's gonna that's gonna get us on you know national television it's gonna be great for the business and i got made a fool out of because you know the whole thing was basically set up in the beginning like before i even walked in they were like okay so you're gonna say you're like a shark going into the shark so they gave me the script to to make me look even more arrogant 
Um, and then, you know, I went in there basically for an hour. Then they chopped it down to obviously 10 minutes mm. to the part that made me look like more of a fool. Um, but hey, you know, again, I, I wish I never did that in some ways, but at the same time, also glad I did because I know at some stage, in some way, shape or form, I'll deal with the media again and I won't be tricked again right. in that capacity to, to make myself look like a fool, um, you know, when it really matters. So it's, you know, all of these things like, I guess, culminated. So, you know, being an entrepreneur, you know, be, you know, not being a victim, be, you know, learning responsibility from a young age, um, learning to sort of like, I, I've never had a paycheck. So like for me to feed myself, I always had to make something or do something or create something. So, so these ingredients like really helped uh, when it came time for me to stumble onto Bitcoin, um, to understand that there was a couple other things as well, sort of, you know, having lost everything in the stock market, I learned about markets. And I also learned a little bit about like, you know, well, I was a gold silver bug in 2011, 2012. Mm. So that sort of, you know, I learned about, you know, the idea of hard money and you know, money printing and QE and all this sort of stuff. So I had all these ingredients sort of all randomly came together um, as I stumbled on Bitcoin and just right. like those things clicked into place. So, in many ways, what I tell people is like, I think my life was, you know, this this mishmash of shit, which, you know, looking back on it doesn't make much sense at all. Like I've been across so many different industries, across so many random things, studied so many different things. Like it's, and none of it sort of has a coherent pattern until I fall over and stumble onto Bitcoin. And then everything starts to be like, oh, fuck, that's useful. Oh, that's useful. Oh, that's useful. Oh, that thing I learned there. Oh, math. Oh, physics. Oh, this or that. Like philosophy. Like I was reading, you know, books on philosophy when I was a 13-year-old kid. Why? Like it had no resemblance to any of the other shit I did. But, you know, all these things sort of started to fall into place. And that's why you know, I say to people, like, Bitcoin is the thing, like, like my the next chapter of my life, like the next 10, 20 years, however long this chapter is going to be, is literally about Bitcoin. Like, um, it's, it's like the, the, the tool that embodies, um, you know, the, the values that I've, that I've forged for my own life through yeah. all the experience that I've been in. So it's a powerful thing. Yeah, man. I've seen a lot of what, what I've kind of get a lot of out of your writing and it is very powerful is but there's, there's this push and pull dynamic and the push is, um, or the, uh, the push is, I'm going to tell you all about Bitcoin and liberty and freedom and what it can do. And the, the pull is kind of like, I'm not going to pull you here, though. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'll show you how to fish, but I'm not going to fish for you. Um, do you think the word is getting out? Do you think more people are talking about money and, and the tool of money and, and what Bitcoin can do for us? Do you, do you think it's kind of like you're just getting, you, you're kind of getting one at a time and we'll just take who we can get? Do you think mo things are moving quickly? Look, that, that, that's a hard one. So, so in the beginning, I was very pushed. Like, you know, so I was doing all these articles and really trying to, like, push people into Bitcoin and, like, um, but um, recently, more particularly with that, you, you would have noticed, like, the, the don't buy Bitcoin yeah, I love article. It. Yeah, so I was like, you know what? Fuck you guys. Like, I'm going to, I'm not going to beg anymore. Like, you want it, it's here. If you don't, if you want to stay ignorant, well, you know, that's your choice too. You can stay ignorant and, you know, don't don't come crying later when you're poor because, you know, the the shit money that you saved up, you know, can't buy your fucking cup of coffee. So it's it's it that that's kind of a more recent attitude for me and it's it it actually emerged I mean it's emerged for multiple reasons. One, because I've just, you know, drained after like sitting there trying to convince so many people and just having it thrown in my face basically. Um, also, I was listening to a um, to a podcast with uh, or, or to a lecture by Jordan Peterson talking, you know, about this idea of um, don't cast pearls before swine, which is you know it's a, it's a biblical reference, and it's it's such an important notion is that you know there's you can spend your energy on the ones that count, and 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 that's sort of what I'm coming around to more so, and you know I think it's also reflected in the recent article that I did about Bitcoin and lockdowns is that. You know, the the existing status quo, the existing institutions, all that stuff, it's unraveling, man. Like, you know, no longer does money represent your your effort and your labor. It's, it's you know, it's, I mean, if you ask Stephanie Kelton, it's just some fucking random points on a pointless scorecard, you know? <laughs> it's like right. two plus two equals 151. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. Like, it's just made up shit, right? So, yeah. so money no longer represents that. You know, your, your savings no longer matter. Like, you know, they're just going to 
inflate the shit out of it so you no longer can save. And, you know, now they're going to bring in new laws like a stupid travel rule and all this stuff where you're not even allowed to spend your own money where you want to. You've got to ask permission for that shit. And, everyone, you know, everyone's going to be imposing know your customers. So all these things are happening. Um, so what's going to happen is, you know, people at some point, you know, the the like the pain is going to ratchet up enough where they're going to be like, fuck, what else is out there? Right. And guess what? There's Bitcoin out there. And, you know, it's the only thing that's going to stand the test of time. And, and, and it's this, you know, there's Noah's Ark. Like I always come back to this idea that it's a fucking Ark. Um, and it's, you know, that there is going to be a massive influx of people wanting some sort of, you know, protection of wealth or, you know, accurate measurement of their wealth or ability to transact without some asshole in the way telling them what they can and cannot do with the product of their own labor. And um, that, that, that's why I'm kind of not too concerned is as much as we need to, to push it forward. I mean, the clown show that is the state is unraveling things so quickly that um, they're going to push people into Bitcoin inadvertently um, by making life worse for everyone. Yeah. Um, it's interesting yeah. in your Bitcoin and lockdowns um, article, you talk about curiosity versus pain. And, you know, <laughs> I guess we're the curious and, and a lot more people are going to come through the pain. And you have this Hell great yeah. quote, uh, the last five billion to adopt Bitcoin will take take will likely take as long as the first five million did. Yeah. What yeah. do you think that, you... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, you go, you go ask the question. No, no, you go. No, I was going to say, that that just hit me as I was writing. That's all. Got I was it. like, yeah. Was, was that going to be a question or... No, no, I was wondering, what, what do you think you'd be doing if Bitcoin didn't exist? Shit, man. I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I reckon I'd be joining some fucking mercenary group <laughs> to fight for freedoms or something. I, I, I really don't know. But, but look, m most likely I would probably be like one of the the Silicon Valley dweebs, like, you know, building random tech things because I thought that that was the right thing to do. Um, so, so I'd probably, yeah, most likely be deep into the entrepreneurial space. Right. Where, where do you um, want to be in 20 years uh, with, without Bitcoin in the framework? Like what, what would be... Something like you'd look back on and be like, I'm glad I did that for the last 20 years or, or I want that to be my legacy. Without Bitcoin or with? Bitcoin? Uh, let's include with, with, with Bitcoin. Okay. Um, look, in, in 20 years time, I, I sort of want to be working on building um, building new private cities, to be honest. That, that's sort of like my long-term plan is once, um, you know, once I build up Amber and, you know, if, if all goes well and then if I can exit the company, you know, at a decent multiple, um, you know, my, my intention then is going to be like, basically I'll take all the money put into Bitcoin, um, you know, sit on it. I, I, I want to spend probably a couple of years just in the quiet, just writing. I have a bunch of books. Like I've got, I basically got the outline and the, the contents for about 20 books that I want to write, um, two zero, I guess. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot there that I want to get out and, um, and I want to kind of combine, um, you know, just principles from different fields and the four fields in particular that I want to combine is, um, is economics, philosophy, psychology, and anthropology. Um, and, and those four just topics, I just find so many overlaps and so like kind of like this, this ability to come to, you know, the, the truth of life and creation through the understanding of the, the, you know, all of those different, um, concepts. So, so I, I'd like to do that, but, you know, re-emerging from that, you know, five, 10 years from now, um, I'd like to start thinking about how to build private cities and how to, you know, bring back, um, you know, private property rights against the backdrop of what I'm sure is going to be quite a um, non-functional, tyrannical type, um, you know, set of states that are that are either running out of resources that are poorly, you know, that aren't operating uh, properly that have, you know, people wanting to get the fuck out of there. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be, um, yeah. Like if, if I look back on tw 20 years is definitely yeah, a long time, man, but uh, I think that's what we need to be doing 20 years from now. And I don't know if that was exactly a question or like what would I be proud of looking back on it or is, is that more a question? Yeah, and it's more of a question of like what are you trying to get out of your life, you know, and, and what would make you satisfied looking back? 
that I um. And I ask because you, you seem to have a tremendous amount of energy and you're putting a lot out there and you're driving really fast, really hard. Mm, mm, and I'm like, mm, where, where is this going for Alex? Yeah. Because um, I get a lot of si- well, I get I get a lot of singularity out of your work, and I, I think that's very that's powerful and it's it's uh, that's good. But I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get more of the story. Yeah. So so when I was when I was younger, I I was really ambitious, and I wanted to be you know at different points in time, I wanted to be like famous for different reasons. So I wanted to be you know at one point I wanted to be an actor, then you know another point I wanted to be like a a world famous um you know entrepreneur so you know like my my idol when i was younger was steve jobs you know i really really have a lot of respect for that man um you know then then i wanted to sort of i, I think they were probably the two the two big ones um i, I think these days like you know that those sort of fantasies have kind of uh lessened for me like um the entrepreneurial one you know i've still got a bit of passion for that but i've always wanted to be remembered for for someone who did something great now i think at this point in time the greatest thing one can do is um is spread good ideas and what i seem to be converging on is um is to be some sort of you know or, or to be remembered as like a a person who spoke truth uh, during a time of madness and you know whether that truth is found through podcasts that people listen to down the track whether it's found through um through videos that i've done myself and and most probably importantly for me is going to be um people who found my writings and my work and and that's kind of why i really want to do something there and and if i can also like through i guess my entrepreneurial expression of my passion that is bitcoin in other words, Amber, if I can also be remembered for someone who helped, you know, onboard a bunch of people uh, into Bitcoin in the early days, I think that's also got a profound um, thing for me. So, so yeah, in, in many ways, like I want to be remembered and I want to look back and say that, you know, I like I had the integrity and the fortitude and the courage to, you know, to stay consistent and to stay true no matter how stupid um society got and how deranged it became um you know i'm, I'm not perfect i'm 100 percent going to make mistakes along the way i'm going to do things that i regret but I, I want my um my overall direction to be consistent and consistent with you know the values that i think are you know aligned with how you know natural law functions um yeah so so yeah man one of the things I pull from you, Randy, one of the many things is, um, you know, Bitcoin is non-political, non-sovereign. And what I'm connecting here is that maybe that platform, that non-sovereign, non-political platform uh, provides, you know, a monetary platform where we don't have to fight over the money via our, our differences. Mm. And yeah, and I, I wonder what you think of that, because uh, I just think that's, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we, we can, we can, we can. Uh trade like so 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 in other words like instead of um instead of beating each other up um and you know and enriching ourselves through the theft of another um you know when when you know the, the cost of theft is high and the um the price of defense is low you know the incentive changes such that um you want to you want to trade and exchange um with those who are different to you um and then you enrich both of uh, but you know you enrich each other instead, and and that's, I think, like, uh, is, is that getting to what you just asked then, or yeah, you know, getting back to the the hard times quote, I, I really vacillate on this one, you know, where we are in it because I wonder maybe Satoshi thought that that he was going through the hard times, and mm-hmm. and providing the solution, and that, that's my hopeful take on it because maybe these are the hard times. I, you know, I waffle because maybe these are the soft times, and you know, we are where we are, but. I'm hopeful that 10 years ago, someone else thought they were going through the hard times and, and we're moving through it now. Um, and I wonder, you know, looking at it from that perspective, and, and, and I want to know from yours, like, do you care about the current U.S. election? Because the American project is such an important thing to us. I'm not sure if the U.S. election, though, this current one is important to you within the framework of, 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 the, of the American project. It, it actually is. Um, you know, I mean... You know, people who are listening to this and who sort of follow me on Twitter, they'll know that I've been very pro-Trump um, throughout the whole period. Um, I think I've even made a couple bets, actually, for you know Trump beating Biden. And 
for me, that's um, the the way I see it is uh, as much as you know Trump gets you know hate for all sorts of things. I actually think um, you know of all the people um, that have ever been politicians, um, he's sort of probably the one with a little bit more skin in the game than any of the other public servants have ever had. So so I think he's actually you know the best thing that uh, could happen for America in the current frame of the the, the democratic republic. So, so, so within the corrupt system that it is, um, he is the best choice by fucking far, but better than, um, you know, the dumbass Kanye, better than, way better than Biden, better than Obama, like better than all that garbage that is, um, that is out there. So, so I think it's really important. I think what it does though, is that it's not like, I, I still don't believe that, you know, the the american state um in its current form can last i think it, this is you know it's gonna it's gonna mm-hmm. fragment but i think what trump does is he 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 really shifts the um like the momentum that we've had over the last you know few decades in particular towards globalization and sort of this idea of one global government he really is a fucking thorn in the side of all of that um and in doing that he actually he 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 raises the incentive for all other nation states to start going internal as well and to to focus on their own shit um, and fix their own sort of house, get their own room in order before they deal with anyone else's. And I think that's going to change the incentive back towards um, you know moving away, moving the pendulum away from globalism, which is exactly what we need because the more we move to globalism, the more we you know move towards you know this. Uh, dystopian tyrannical sort of uh future so Mm -hmm. trump in that sense is very good because he's going to start the pendulum swinging in in the opposite direction and start you know moving us back onto the path towards localization and it's going to happen you know less destructively because the the other option is that we end up you know with a moron like fucking biden in there you know they sort of sell the last of america's soul and strength to you know global um you know organizations like the wef and the who and all that sort of fucking garbage and we start to sort of be governed you know under this whole you know the the new reset or you know the new world order whatever the fuck people want to call it these days um and that you know start to get you know larger and larger uh, more and more powerful and but the thing is that will collapse under its own weight because you know it, it becomes more and more fragile the larger it gets like you can't um, you know, th- th- those kind of systems will always break, no matter how good or smart they think they are. Um, you know, uh, reality, humanity, and organic systems are too um, too complex for any sort of uh, centrally managed system to subsist for long enough. Now, the the downside of going down that path is that that collapse will be extremely pay- painful, violent, um, and I mean, even the path along the way for, you know, anyone who believes in sovereignty and individuality, it's, you know, you, they we're going to have a hard fucking time. So at least with Trump getting in, the momentum is sort of like we, we, we steer away from, we, we avert a major, major, major potential crisis. Um, and we then, the individualists and the libertarians and the people who believe in, you know, private property and, you know, and individual freedom and liberties, we can actually then, fight to keep the momentum going towards further and further localization um, and fragmentation, which is, you know, the only thing that'll save us. So I actually think this is an extremely important thing. Um, I think Trump will save the last of, you know, whatever's left of the American spirit. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I really fucking hope that he wins. All right. What's the other side of the coin though? I'm not, I'm not a political uh, pollster, so I have no idea who's going to win. But what, what's the, the other side of the coin for you if Trump loses? Ooh, like, like I said, it's Biden wins and we go towards a you know global mm. global world order kind of thing. You know that that's that's the potential disaster. Like if Trump does not win, um, America will have the last of its um, you know uh, strength sold off. Um, you know, it, it, basically we're we're looking at a you know a world of a global credit system of um, of what it looks like in China today. Um, is, is the end game the rates. same? Are they both just accelerationists then, or, or are there different end games via this political no, it's, construct? It's, who, who Trump and Biden? You yeah. Mean, or? Yeah. Okay. So, so you might have misheard me in the beginning when I was describing all of that in the beginning. I wasn't describing Trump. I was describing 
if Biden got in, that's what would happen. If Trump gets in, I think we move away from that. So I, I think we move away from, um, you know, a China style social credit system. I think we move away from a global regime. I think we, you know, we, we move away from funding these, you know, shitty organizations like the WEF, like the, you know, the WHO, like, you know, the World Economic Forum, right. you know, whatever they are. So I think Trump stands in the way of that. And that's why I think he's good by far. Okay. So if, if um, it seems like there's a, a strong movement by, you know, free and libertarian thinkers away from global government. Yes. And, and how do we frame that, though, with like Bitcoin? Because I see Bitcoin as like global money. Mm-hmm. So on one hand, we want to move away from globalism. And mm-hmm. on the other hand, maybe we want to move towards globalism. It's it's not globalism. Not so, sure. so globalism, yeah, no. See, globalism is this idea that um, you know the globe is better run by you know uh, academics and the you know the 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 leaders who you know instead of uh, people leading their own um, countries, it should all be run centrally right. through you know major central banks and you know uh, these so called you know organizations that um that are supposedly going to look after the world the imf and all that bullshit so 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 that's what globalism represents and that's a really fucking bad idea so so bitcoin empowers individuals but allows us to communicate globally yeah. and, and that's that's very 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 yeah. very different because um you can't concentrate power with bitcoin um it's impossible um so so so, so that's the real um uh, change there and then what happens is when you um, empower individuals, you, you actually start to fragment society. And that's what we want. We want more fragmentation and we want more localization because when you have localization, it's it's your communities and the people around you that become more important. Then you start to create, you, you create prosperity in each localized region um, and lo- you, you then create more trade. You create uh, better use of the resources in the local region. You, you then can protect private property better. All this sort of stuff starts to flourish when things are more fragmented and localized, as opposed to them being these um, large-scale, homogenous fucking um, mandates and ideas and governments that are you know, sorry mandates and ideas that are passed by these homogenous fucking governments that um, want to be the caretaker for all 7 billion people who are fundamentally all fucking different. Right. Like you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying. This has been awesome. I've really enjoyed jamming with you, Alex. Um, 100%, man. Yeah, man. Is there anything else you want to cover? Um, before? Look, man, I think, I guess I haven't done a pod for a little while. I mean, I've, I've got, I guess one thing if, you know, whoever's listening to this, you know, definitely check out some of those articles, but I've got a, I've got a big thing that I'm working on at the moment. Um, well, a couple of things. One is I'm, I'm writing another one called uh, "Resistance is Not Futile," um, and you know, the, the, and and the the idea of it is going to be to to inspire people. It's going to be a fiery article, kind of like "Rise of the Individual, Fall of the State," and it's going to the the idea is to empower people to 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 speak up, you know, against stupidity and to speak up against madness, like you know all of this hysteria that we're seeing with Corona and lockdowns and everything like that. Right. So, so there's that, but then more importantly, I'm working on Bitcoin times edition three um, and rise of the individual fall of the state was from edition two. Mm. Um, edition three is going to have um, me, Jeff Booth, Giacomo Zucco, um, uh, Parker Lewis, um, Jimmy Song and Eric Kesson in it. It's going to be like, it's going to be some really, really, really good pieces, man. So that's that awesome. I'm going to try and, get out yeah by the end of this month by the end of november so people should keep an eye out for that that's really cool we're going to talk to jimmy song in a little bit um you know i implore everyone to check out your articles on medium i think it's dope and to stack sats on uh amber uh, and let everyone else know where they could find you uh it's sweet man so on twitter just alex svetsky my name is spelled a little bit different a l e k s then svetsky is s v e t s k i and my medium is just svetsky.medium.com uh and yeah man that, that's really the two places that i'm that i am most um i'm gonna be doing more of these podcasts in the coming in the coming weeks i think i've got one coming up with mccormack we're gonna be debating a couple of things about sort of democracy collectivism statism and all that sort of crap sure sweet I'll um, check that and then, out. yeah man and then i think other than that yeah amber's available in australia at the moment and 
Um, there's a, you know, I, I may have a surprise with respect mm. to coming to the US soon. So, um, so yeah, we'll um, see how that pans out. I'll stack those sats uh, in Australia on Amber. This has been dope. I really appreciate it. Peace. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks. Alex Svetsky, man on the move, going full sovereign right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the show, please vote with your thumbs and press those five stars. That's the best way to spread the word. This is Cedric. Peace.